Amen. Great to be free, isn't it? Sun makes you free. You are free indeed. I think we, we'd all agree that rejection is a painful experience. When you're young and you make an effort to ask a girl out, and she says, ew, no, that can really bruise the old ego. And you think about that. Why don't they like me? And, and you conclude, well, I guess I'm not very likable. I'm ugly. I'm weird. I'm chubby. I'm just not good enough. Yeah, that chubby thing, that was, that's right there. And that kind of sticks in your mind. And you, you, th- you, you go to try again, but those thoughts keep popping back up. You're ugly. You're weird. You're chubby. You're, you're not good enough. You're not likable. And that'll plague you. It'll hurt you for many years. I look back at my life, and I can tell you a lot of sad stories about how I felt rejected time after time after time. All those hard experiences, you kind of think, play them over in your mind. Rejected by girls I liked. I got cut from sports teams I tried out for. I got excluded from social circles I wanted to be a part of. People I tried to befriend, they weren't really interested in being my friend. I lived in a community that didn't seem like it wanted me around. I have family members who have no desire of talking to me. I lost student council elections. Uh, jobs I applied for never got back to me. Jobs I interviewed for said thanks but no thanks. And even ministries I was pastoring, my resignation made certain people very happy. And uh, they all said the right things to my face, but I knew they were so pleased to accept my resignation and see me get out of there. If I stopped and dwell on it for a moment, I can feel very sad about all the rejection that I've experienced. But you know what feeling sad will get you? Absolutely not. The people who are rejecting you do not care about how sad it makes you. They do not care whether you rise or fall. And the fighting, screaming, crying, begging, arguing in the world will make no difference. Their mind is already made up. And I realized the only thing I could do is move along. Pick myself up and try again somewhere else. And I had discovered that a uh, new environment, there was new people to befriend, there's new tr- teams to try out for, there's different jobs to apply for. When I resigned from the People's Church in Toronto, Nova Scotia, after seven years of ministry, my mentor, Pastor Chess McKenzie, said to me, don't worry, brother, as long as you preach the word, God will have a place for you. And you know what? That's a fact. I have seen that proven in three different major transitional times in my life because I committed myself to staying true to God's word and delivering his message, there's always been someplace else for me to go. And I may have been rejected many times, but not all the times. You know, you may get 10 go aways from 10 different girls, but you only need one to say, I do. You can have five different churches tell you thanks, but no thanks, but you only need one to say, come work with us. What we're going to observe today is Jesus prescribes the exact same strategy to his servants here in Luke chapter 10. If they reject your message of the kingdom, he tells them, move along. However, there is a scary warning, a damning decree made against those who reject Jesus. If you listen carefully today, you will learn how relevant this message is for America today. Luke chapter 10, verse number 8. A little bit of review from last week, but we're going to read down through 16. So Jesus sent out his messengers, saying to them, whatever city you enter into, they receive you, eat what is set before you, Heal those who are sick and say to them, the kingdom of God has come near to you. But whatever city you enter and they do not receive you, go out into its streets and say, even the dust of your city which clings to our feet, we wipe off in protest against you. Yet be sure of this, the kingdom of God has come near. I say to you, it would be more tolerable in that day for Sodom than for that city. Woe to you, Chorazin. Woe to you, Bethsaida, for if the miracles had been performed in Tyre and Sidon, which occurred in you, they would have repented long ago, sitting in sackcloth and ashes. But it will be more tolerable for Tyre and Sidon 
in the judgment than for you. And you, Capernaum, will not be exalted to the heavens, will you? You will be brought down to Hades. For the one who listens to you, listens to me. And the one who rejects you, rejects me. And the one who rejects me, rejects the one who sent me. So Jesus sends his followers out into the cities to heal and to declare the kingdom of God is near. The point of the healings, the point of the miracles, was to validate the message about the kingdom of God being near. So think about this. The followers obey and they, they travel and they arrive at the various cities and they're healing people and people are getting helped and people are getting blessed and then the message about the kingdom is given to these folks but then they turn around and reject that message. And then what happens, the messengers of Jesus are instructed to what? Move along to another city. You can't make them believe. You can't force them to stop rejecting you. So you just move along. Nevertheless, be warned. There's consequences. Now, the people who had already been healed will continue to have their healing. The people who were helped and blessed are enjoying that current state of blessing, but it's not going to last Matter of fact, it's going to go from blessing to curses real fast. It's all about to be flipped from healing and help to hell on earth. Why? Well, the city that does not receive the message of the kingdom of God, whoever rejects God's messages, messengers, rejects God himself. And since they reject God, God gives them what they ask for. He removes his blessings he resends the invitation to come be a part of his kingdom. And now what kingdom are you left in? Think about that for a moment. You reject Jesus the Messiah's invitation to be part of his kingdom, so you're not going to be in that kingdom. What kingdom is left for you to be a part of? The kingdom of the enemy. The kingdom that is opposed to the righteous rule. His, Jesus, is the kingdom of life and light. The opposite is death and darkness. Matthew chapter 8, verse number 10, Jesus says, He marveled and said to those who were following, Truly I say to you, I have not found such great faith with anyone in Israel. I say to you that many will come from east and west and recline at the table of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob in the kingdom of heaven. But the sons of the kingdom will be cast out. Where? Into the outer darkness. And there's, where that place, there's weeping, and gnashing of teeth. See, here's the thing. All are invited all are welcome to become part of Jesus' kingdom. If you believe in God, if you will worship Him, if you will serve Him, you're welcomed in. He is the eternal King, and He gives to all in His kingdom eternal life. But if you don't believe God, if you reject Him, then you will remain in the kingdom of darkness, and you will suffer the fate of all those who reject the true and rightful King of the earth. You put yourself at odds with God, and you will be cursed. Jesus says, Luke chapter Ten. He says, whatever city you enter into doesn't receive you, wipe the dust of that city that clings to you and protest, saying, the kingdom of God has come near. I say to you, it would be more tolerable that day for Sodom. Woe to you, Cortazine. Woe to you, Bethsaida. The miracles that were performed in Tyre and Sidon occurred in you. They would have repented long ago, sitting in sackcloth and ashes. More tolerable for Tyre and Sidon in the judgment than for you. And you, Capernaum, will you be exalted to the heavens, will you? you will be brought down to Hades. Here are the consequences when the message of the kingdom leaves your city. You will be judged like Tyre and like Sodom. Sodom and Gomorrah, from the book of Genesis, was a horribly wicked city. The people there were so perverted and violent to the extreme that they wanted to sodomize strangers as they came into town. According to Genesis chapter 18, verse 20, the Lord said, because of the exceeding great wickedness, I'm going to utterly destroy these cities. That's quite a fierce warning, isn't it? Jennifer, what you taught us today, that should make us a little bit concerned, shouldn't it? That God is going to destroy because of the exceeding great witness, exceeding great wickedness, that type of culture. Tyre, likewise, is in many prophecies of destruction being made against it, but one in particular really stands out if you turn in your copy of the Word of God to Ezekiel chapter 28, Ezekiel chapter 28, in Ezekiel, uh, a prophecy is being made uh, concerning the destruction of the king of Tyre. In verse number two, it says, Son of man, say to the leader of Tyre, thus says the Lord, because your heart is filled up, and you have said, I am a God, and I sit in the seats of the gods, 
in the heart of the seas, yet you are a man, not a God, although you make your heart to be like a God. So, like many ancient rulers of that day and antiquities, they claimed to be the descendants of gods. They would, the kings would claim to be a god, even though he's just a man, it says here. But then, another prophecy is made in the same chapter against the king of Tyre, but listen to this one, because it's a little bit different. That's verse 12. So chapter 28, same chapter, verse 12. Listen carefully. Son of man, take up a lamentation against the king of Tyre and say to him, Thus says the Lord God, You had the seal of perfection, full of wisdom, and perfect in beauty. You were in Eden, the, gar the garden of God. Okay, wait a second. How many people were Eden in the garden of God? Adam and Eve. So this king of Tyre, I don't remember him being in Genesis. Who's this? See if you can figure it out. Every precious stone was your covering, the ruby, the topaz, the diamond, the beryl, onyx, the jasper, the labeth, the lazu, the turquoise, and the emerald, and the gold, and the workmanship of your settings and sockets was in you. On the day you were created, you were prepared. You were the anointed cherub who covers. You got to hand it now who this is? You know who this is now? This is Lucifer. This is Lucifer. The anointed cherub who covers. And I placed you there, and you were on the holy mountain of God. You walked in the midst of the stones of fire. You were blameless in all your ways from the day you were created until unrighteousness was found in you. By the abundance of your trade, you were internally filled with violence, and you sinned. Therefore, I cast you as profane from the mountain of God, and I destroyed you, O covering cherub, from the midst of the stones of fire. Your heart was lifted up because of your beauty. You corrupted your wisdom by reason of your splendor. I cast you to the ground. I put you before kings, that they may see you by the multitude of your iniquities in the unrighteousness of your trade. You profaned your sanctuaries. Therefore, I brought fire from the midst of you and it has consumed you and I have turned you into ash on the earth in the eyes of all who see all who know among the peoples are appalled by you they become terrified and you will cease to be forever here we see the Lord proclaiming the destruction of Lucifer Satan, the devil, who was originally created to be a cherub, but he rebelled, he rejected God's rule, he wanted his own kingdom, and thus was cast out of the mountain of God, cast out of heaven. He wasn't able to dethrone God. He wasn't able to take God's throne. So what domain was left for him to rule? Well, it's the earth, right? Even though the earth was given to Adam and essentially mankind to have dominion over it, Satan has influenced mankind to enslave one another, right? Build kingdoms and cults and false religions to honor him. We know that the governments and the kingdoms of men are under Satan's influence, but he doesn't quite get the praise and the adoration he desires with this setup. He has to share the glory with men, and he always has to lie and deceive, to steal, kill, and destroy, to stay in power. After all, he is a spirit, and he can't completely inhabit the physical world. So like in Ezekiel 28, there is a human king over Tyre, but there is also a spiritual king, Lucifer, who is working in and through the human king. We see this in Satan's interactions with Jesus during the 40 days of testing in the wilderness. Remember, Satan took Jesus up to a high mountain and showed him all the kingdoms of the world and said, I'll give you all the kingdoms of the world if you'll worship me. And Jesus didn't argue and say, you don't own them. Apparently he owned them. Apparently he could do that. We also see Satan's power over the kingdoms and the empires of this world depicted in the beast of Revelation who gives power to, whose power comes from Satan. You see the beast of the Revelation, he gets his power from the dragon who is Satan. Here in Luke chapter 10, Jesus is offering the nation of Israel the, the chance to accept him as Messiah and receive the kingdom of God. But they reject him and now they remain in the kingdom of Satan. And Jesus says it'll be worse for them than it was for Sodom and Tyre, which is why the messengers have to get out of town. They have to move on from these accursed cities, even shaking the dust of those places off their feet. They don't want any part of it on them because they don't want to be affiliated with such a place that's going to come under such fierce wrath of God. It's going to be so much worse for these cities. Jesus said it would, be, it, it, it would be, be easier for Sodom and Tyre because those, why was the reason? Because those places, they didn't have the miracles performed in them. And those places didn't receive the Messiah, right? Jesus never came to Sodom. 
Tyre never was visited by the Messiah. Those people had a personal invitation. Chorazin and Bethsaida and Capernaum. Personal invitation from God himself. And Jesus takes the rejection very personally. You saw the miracles. You experienced the blessings. You heard the word of God directly in your ears. They rejected God personally. And so, Jesus takes this rejection personally. And he declares, Woe. The primary expression of grief. It's what people said when they were going to have the greatest distress imaginable. It's death and destruction. Every aspect of your life falling apart before your very eyes. It's wildfires burning your home down, markets collapsing and wealth evaporating, sickness and disease stealing your health, farms stealing, famine stealing your crops, invaders possessing your land. Everything horrible you don't want to have happen, that's happening. That's, what's the word? Whoa. And that's what they're going to experience. Chorazin, Bethsaida, and Capernaum. You don't want the heavenly kingdom, you will receive hell. Wow. Pretty bad news for those cities. Sucks to be them. Good thing we don't live there, eh? Verse 16. Jesus says to his messengers, the ones who listen to you listens to me, and the ones who reject you rejects me, and he who rejects me rejects the one who sent me. The one who rejects me, Jesus says, rejects who sent him? God the Father. Here's the thing. God is unchanging. He is the same yesterday, today, and for. Ever. The principle stated by Jesus in Luke 10, 16 is still in effect. If you reject Jesus, you reject God. And if you reject God, then... Whoa. Last Sunday, last week, January 3rd, 2021, Congressman Emmanuel Cleaver prayed for the opening of the 117th Congress. Who got their homework and watched it? Okay. If you're not on the e email distribution, you didn't get your homework, you'll have to look this up. I'm going to quote it, but I invite you to go look this up and get on the email. and You can get all kinds of cool things from Pastor Rob. Here's the prayer that was prayed by Pastor Emmanuel Cleaver, congressman. You might recognize the words because you sang a few minutes ago. Now may the God who created the world and everything in it bless us and keep us. May the Lord make his face shine upon us and be gracious unto us. May the Lord lift up the light of his countenance upon us and give us peace. Well, we all agree with that, right? That's what we sang amen to. Peace on our families, peace across the land, and dare I say, O oh Lord, peace even in this chamber, now and forevermore. Good prayer. We ask it in the name of the monotheistic God Brahma, the God known by many names, many different faiths, a man and a woman. An ordained United Methodist pastor prayed in the name of the Creator God of Hinduism. He asked it in the name of the monotheistic God Brahma. I'm quoting him. The name known by a God known by many names and many different faiths. Here's Brahma as he is depicted in the idol that is his. We don't have that, that's fine. Brahma is the chief god of Hinduism. Hinduism Hindus believe in 330 million gods. So Brahma has never been affiliated with monotheism, meaning there's only one god. Hindus believe in reincarnation. You live your life. If you're good, you come back as a higher species when you died. If you, like a cow, that's the highest. Man, you could all aspire to be a cow. How about that? Anybody ever calls you a cow? That's not an insult in Hinduism. If you're bad, you come back as a lower species, like a rat. The hope is that you learn to be good, and you could eventually ascend to becoming a higher being. So this congressman, Emmanuel Cleaver, was praying to Brahma. Everyone got distracted by the ah man and the ah woman part that he ended in, which is another whole level of foolishness. But the deeper issue is they are now praying to false gods, to demons. Brahma 
declaring a false god to be the Lord and Creator. He attributed the ironic blessing of number six to Brahma. This ought to be a great cause of concern for the, first of all, the United Methodist denomination. If there's any God-fearing people in the leadership of that organization, they ought to immediately call for the recension of this man's ordination. What Christian organization can affiliate with a minister praying to Brahma? And I watched all week for something to be reported somewhere that the Methodists would have been a tiny bit concerned, not a peep. Furthermore, this ought to be the biggest concern, cause for concern for us. Why? Why is that any cause of concern for ours? Where was this prayer prayed? The United States Congress, 535 members, 100 senators, 435 representatives. These are America's leaders. And they all stood and accepted the prayer. And the head of Congress, Nancy Pelosi, agreed and affirmed the prayer. The leaders of our nation in the assemblies are officially praying to demons. This is wholesale rejection of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ by the 117th Congress of the United States of America. This has cursed the nation. This nation will experience heinous woes. As we reject God in His holy name, He will reject us. Verse 16, He who rejects me, rejects the one who sent me. In light of this great apostasy by Congressman Cleaver, in light of the rejection by our nation's leaders, in light of the fact that I have not seen a national leader come out and rebuke these doctrines of demons, I feel that it is necessary to make a statement. There will at least be one church in this nation that will cry out in shock and horror. So I prayed about this all week. And we now must obey what the Lord Jesus Christ prescribed the, king, the messengers of His kingdom to do. Shake the dust of this accursed place off us to represent our commitment to Jesus' kingdom and the rejection of this nation's leaders, affiliations with demons, we are removing the symbol of our nation from our sanctuary. Until repentance is made by America's leaders in the Congress before God, we cannot associate with their leadership. We must shake the dust off us, lest we fall under the same condemnation. So with great sadness of heart, in a moment of silence, the flag is removed. Hear the word of the Lord. Revelation chapter 18. After these things, I saw another angel come down from heaven, having great authority in the earth, was illuminated with his glory. And he cried out with a mighty voice, saying, Fallen, fallen is Babylon the great. She has become a dwelling place of demons, and every prison of every unclean spirit, a prison of every unclean, hateful bird, for all the nations have drunk the wine and the passion of immorality. The kings of the earth have committed acts of immorality with her. The merchants of the earth have become rich with the wealth of her sensuality. I heard another voice from heaven saying, Come out of her, my people, so you will not participate in her sins and receive her plague. God of Abraham, Isaac, and Israel, let it be known today here in this congregation that you alone are God. To you alone we pledge our allegiances. We are offended that your great name has been rejected by our nation's leaders. They have prayed your promised blessings and then they attributed them to a demon. We reject this apostasy and we declare that you alone are God. We beg that you will not visit your wrath upon us. We are your children. We shake the dust of this apostate nation off of us. And we ask that you would convict these people in D.C., this nation, convict churches all around this country with such a burning conviction that it will break this spirit of apostasy. We pray for their repentance and their salvation, that they will come to know and believe that Jesus is King of kings and Lord of lords, and there is no other God beside you. And we petition all this in your holy name, Yeshua HaMashiach, Jesus the Messiah. And all God's people said, Amen. This is a, a sad day. 
And I knew that was going to hurt. And I suspect it's caused you much concern, as it should. But I don't want us to leave out of here in that state of mind. We've also done another symbolic gesture this morning. I don't know if you noticed or not, but instead of hanging our winter seasonal banners, I requested the, the decorating committee would hang this set right here. On a week where people pray to false gods, I want our Heavenly Father to see that His children know His name. We exalt His greatness. We declare His fame to the nation. I don't know about the rest, but there will be one church in America that will bless His holy name. His holy name. The Lord Nisi, the Lord our banner. Jehovah Yireh, the Lord our provider. Yahweh Rapha, the Lord our healer. Yahweh Shalom, the Lord our peace. Yahweh Roha, the Lord our shepherd. Yahweh Sabaoth, the Lord of hosts, the God of armies. May His name be exalted in the congregation today. We're going to close with a, this song again. Listen to the words as we read them again. Numbers chapter 6, 22. Then the Lord spoke to Moses saying, Speak to Aaron and to his sons, saying, Thus you shall bless the sons of Israel. Say to them, The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face shine upon you and be gracious to you. The, lift up, the Lord lift up his countenance upon you and give you peace. Now catch this last verse. So they shall invoke my name on the sons of Israel and then we will bless them. I then will bless them, God says. Invoke my name and I then will bless them. We invoke the name of the Lord on of our, the Lord our God on you, Faith Bible Church. We invoke the name of the Lord our God on you, followers of Jesus. We invoke the name of the Lord our God on you, messengers of the gospel, so that you will not fall under this woe. You will not suffer this wrath. We are saved by his name. We are called by his name. And we are blessed by his great name. May his presence go before you and behind you and beside you, all around you and within you. He is with you. He is with you. Michael, sing that blessing upon the people this morning. Sing it out like we believe it. Lord bless you and keep you, make his face shine upon you, be gracious to you, Lord turn his face toward you and give you peace. In agreement we say amen. Amen, 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 Father, Son, and Spirit, His favor. And His favor be upon you in a thousand generations. In your family, in your children, in their children, in their children. May His favor be upon you in a thousand generations. In your family, in your children, in their children. Children, may His presence go before you and behind you and beside you, all around you and within you. He is with you, He is with you in the morning, in the evening, in your coming and your going, in your weeping and rejoicing. He is for you, He is for you, 
I did not know how that was going to go off. But we wanted to do that for the nation's sake. You get that live stream. And by the way, I wanted to let you know that we were having some serious audio problems before this service. Get that thing up for the live stream. But God answered our prayers. We asked that to come together. not a prophet. I don't know what's going to happen in this nation, but we are going to preach the word of God, and we're going to stand on it wherever that goes, wherever that leads us. That would be great. That would be great. The Lord will bless us. Amen? Bless you. Be a fun.